And now, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Robin D.G. Kelly and Chinoye Chukwu. Thank you so much for being here tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How are you all doing? Hello. Ooh. Hi. Oh, good. Don't don't leave, because you're gonna miss something very <laughs> special. Just so you can't leave, okay? And we don't have much time. I thought we had like a lot of time, but we only have about 20 minutes for everything. I have some questions. First of all. Um, this is such a spectacular film. Um, as I was telling Janoya, uh, um, I was, uh, I seen it like nine times. So this is the ninth time. And so welcome back to The Hammer because you were here virtually when Clemency came out. Yes, and, years ago. Uh, which is a, a masterpiece. Uh, Till, of course, is a masterpiece. Um, and so I, I'm gonna try to avoid the kind of common questions you get all the time. Uh, Thank you. you know, but I'm going to begin <laughs> by answering one question, okay. and I'm going to answer the question that okay. you get all the time, and that is, why has it taken so long to make a feature film about this case? And when I say long, so like you know, it actually goes back before Keith Beauchamp. In fact, it goes back to um, Mamie signed a contract in 1956 to do a film with Jay Bradford Hewer of all people to be screenwriter. But the real reason why it took so long is because uh, Chinoya is the only director who could have made this film, right? <laughs> and it's true. And I'm gonna, we're going to find out why. Um, and Danielle Deadweiler is the only actress who could have realized your vision and embodied that vision. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so from now on, that is the answer to the question. <laughs> that is the answer. And, and of course, it, you know, you have to be um, a Nigerian-born person who grew up in Alaska to have the sensitivity to make this film, <laughs> right? O only you could do that, so. <laughs> Y'all ever met another Nigerian-born Alaskan-raised <laughs> person? All right. <laughs> in any case, you know, so I'm sitting with the most visionary filmmaker. Uh, you made these three feature films, two centering black women, never succumbing to the trope of the strong black woman, but instead giving us these amazingly rich, human, complex women who are intelligent, vulnerable, resilient, who are all actually on a journey. Mm. And so I want to get now into this question. So we know from the press that the producers recruited you uh, to this project after seeing Clemency, um, and you agreed to do it on certain conditions. So I have two questions. The first one is, what were you going to do before Till? Because I'm assuming that you had a project and you might have set it aside. And then the second question is, what were those conditions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, so I was um, attached to a few other projects that fell apart um, during COVID. Um, I think a lot of things changed for a lot of people during COVID, and um, then I knew I was reluctant to take I was reluctant to um, take on Till because I just didn't think I was emotionally I'd have the emotional capacity to do it, and it wasn't just the subject matter. But when I made Clemency, my whole life shifted um, after my film won Sundance, and I was really thrust into the business of filmmaking, the business of this craft that I love so. Much and dedicated my life to and that was a huge shift and um, you know Barbara Broccoli who's one of the producers and Whoopi Goldberg who's another producer they're they're quite persistent people <laughs> and they said we're only making this film with you we know you are the person so when you're ready we'll be ready for you but if you could be ready now that'd be great um, <laughs> And so I really had to take, it took me about a year or a year and a half before I, 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 do, I dove in. Right. Um, and I had to really emotionally and spiritually recalibrate and get myself ready for it. And I have to say, when, um, af when I was participating in protests, 
um, against police brutality that was that was instigated after George Floyd was was lynched, um, th that really got me ready. Right. I was like, you know what? It, it woke it like it just it just it. I just like kind of sat straight up. I'm like, okay, right. I'm ready to do this. The, in, the the mission is clear. Let's go. And then it was just full steam ahead. And it was full steam ahead, and you also laid out some conditions. That is, yes. So centered on Mamie's story. The thing, the, the thing that made the me making this film a, a no brainer um, was, you know, when I met the producers, I I knew that the only way that I was interested in telling the story, the only way that the story could really be told, is if it is so ex like exclusively and specifically focused on Mamie. She is our protagonist and needs to be focused on her emotional point of view for without Mamie Till Mobley, we wouldn't know who Emmett Till was. And she, a black woman, needs to be centered in her rightful place in history. And black women are so often erased right. from the screen, from history, ex from especially stories around civil rights and freedom movements when we are the backbone of those movements. And so it became a mission for me to not only center her, but to humanize her, mm -hmm. and to humanize her in a way that goes so far beyond the trope of grieving mother, or um, you know the archetype of that, um, and to make her a fully realized person with a life, work, a man, family, right. church, and we show her anger as well, and her vulnerability as well, as, as well as all of these range of emotions. Right. And the producers were like, you know what? That's what we want as well. Um, I also didn't want to show any physical violence on screen. Um, it wasn't necessary in order to tell Mamie's story, to show the violence. I didn't want to do it as a human being, as a black person. It was a way that I was going to show care for audiences as well. The producers were on board. And working with the studio um, at Orion at MGM, I mean, they gave me full creative autonomy. The producers really gave me the space to, to tell this in an artful, cinematic way that I thought it needed to be told in. And, and that's just a dream for a filmmaker, right. to have that kind of freedom. Exactly. Were you given a script that you rewrote? I, I, I did do a rewrite, a, a rewrite on the script. So there was an existing script that was written years ago um, by um, uh, one of the two of the producers, mm -hmm. Keith Beauchamp and Mike Riley, and um, their producers were very open to a writer director coming on board and rewriting and making it their own. Right, because you know, knowing a little bit about the script as it circulated, I know your rewrites were significant. Yeah, uh, and I page one. Yeah, <laughs> 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 and you know, and in, in many ways, what's significant because you know we talk about. Um, not showing violence, mm -hmm. and a lot of that has to do with protecting community, but a lot of it also has to do with the the the, uh, the sort of gravity of the story that it's on movement, it's on Mamie as a movement, yeah. the, her her transformation, but not but actually let me back up, not her transformation, but the way she transformed a movement by yes. centering yes. the yes. fundamental question of what it means to be um, a mother yes. and to lose a child, which is always central. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I want you to talk a little bit about what you changed in the script, what it meant to make it uh, centered on Mamie's story, both emotionally, politically, but also like visually, mm -hmm. her point of view. Yeah, I mean, I, I really believe as a storyteller um, that you can tell any story and have audiences connect to it if you really root it in humanity. Mm -hmm. If you make, uh, if you can use narrative and cinematic techniques to communicate the what the what each character is emotionally navigating, you know. And so that was always my focus, and and that was one of the biggest things that I made sure to incorporate into the script. Having those moments when Mamie is alone and just sitting with herself, you know, and, and I knew I was gonna make that very visually cinematic, 
but I but in the writing it was important to show these different layers of Mamie when she's with herself, when she's just with her son, when she's in the courtroom, when she's with her man, when she's in the, you know, the, there, there are these different presentational selves that she's navigating. Um, and so that was one of the biggest ways that I um, really incorporate, I, I really showed her humanity in the in the script. And, and, and also having these, like the relationship with her father, mm -hmm. her relationship with Jean, um, her relationship with her mother, having those have their own mini arcs as well um, in the story and, and giving um, a complex emotional depth to all of the supporting characters as well. Exactly, and you do it so beautifully visually through composition, Thank through you. camera, and we'll get to that. Okay. Um, but before that, um, let's talk about the goat. Danielle Deadwater. Danielle Deadwater. Um, and yes. I, have, I have to say, full disclosure, people who know me uh, know that um, uh, un unless Danielle's sister's in the room, there's no bigger fan than me. Because I was a fan of Danielle in 2004 when she was my student, walked into my graduate seminar. Um, I directed her, her master's, her, one of her master's theses. And as you know, she's a polymath. And I don't say that lightly. This is someone who uh, is a visual artist who's shown her work. She is a dancer. She, um, of course, um, cultural studies scholar. She's a brilliant poet who has a master's degree in poetry. Uh, she's going to be one of the few people to get both an Academy Award, a Pulitzer, and probably all kinds of things, right? Um, and she's a revolutionary. You know, and so I'm, I'm just curious, obviously you've shared in, in lots of interviews and, and other things what it was like to work with her, and I'd love to hear some of those stories, but specifically, I want to know from your vantage point as a director, what did she bring to the film that you hadn't envisaged in, in both writing uh, the script, because I know everything you do is intentional, but then she brings all this experience and knowledge and art yeah. uh, sensibility um, and politics. And I know she's read a lot because she read a lot in my class. Mm -hmm. She is so smart. Right. <laughs> Ooh, yes. No, I mean, she, I knew that she can hold a screen and command or command a screen without saying a word. I knew that she would be able to carry this film, but. I mean, the testimony scene. There were eight or nine other setups planned for that scene, but her coverage was the first thing that we shot, and I didn't know she could do that. And when she did that, all of those eight or nine other setups went away. <laughs> and I looked at my cinematographer, Bobby Bukowski, and we're like, all right, we're going to do this in uh, one take called the studio to make sure they don't snatch me up. And <laughs> I'm like, we're about to do a six minute, 45 second oneer um, in a studio film. <laughs> and they're like, if you believe it's what needs to be done, let it happen. Um, but she transcends in this performance. Mm -hmm. And she, I, I wasn't, I knew she was excellent, but the, I mean, she exceeded all expectations. Right. Not many people can hold a six minute, 45 second long take on your face. Right. Right. Not many people can do that. And and she, that was what's in the film is the sixth take. Mm -hmm. But she gave that level performance every time, right? single take. I wasn't expecting her to be that consistently excellent. And she gives something different each take. She's right. not like a robot, you know? And so, I mean, every take in the film was excellent, excellent. And so that was a pleasant surprise. And she's so present and focused in the moment. Right. Um, and one of the things, one of the many things I love about her is that we were really partners in this. Like right. I really felt like I had a creative partner, even to this day in this whole journey and the, and the you know, pu publicity and press and awards campaigning and stuff like that. It's just, we're still, we still have our, are in, are in sync and in rhythm. Yeah. Well, she's a perfect actor for you because one of the th amazing, you know, you remade filmmaking, just so you know that. I mean, you, know, you remade it, and this is one of the ways you, re you, you remade, it, remade it with clemency and certainly with Till, but one of the conventions that I think you introduced in a very powerful way is focusing the camera on not the speaker, 
not the source of the words, yeah. but the source of the what protagonist or whatever yeah. figure is trying to struggle with these yes. questions. And even the scene with, uh, with Mamie in the courtroom, that's her, but you hear the, yes. you hear the questions yes. off, off yes. the frame. Yes. Uh, you, you, the opening scene in the car, um, where Danielle's able to tell, do a prelude of the yep. entire film. Yep in about a minute and 45 yep. seconds yep. with her eyes. Yep. And you have the music, yep. the moon glows, yep. and that's there. Yep. Um, and there was one other thing that I just, oh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, the way that the camera, uh, you know, the way that you have all these shots with there's no words, that's not in the script, right? There may be some direction, but this is something you're creating with her on the spot. And of course you do it with clemency. Yeah. That scene where Alfre Woodard is off camera and you see um, you know, yeah, Anthony Aldous Hodge, Aldous Hodge yeah. you know, hearing the protocols yep. of, of what it means to be executed and you see his face and the tear comes down. I mean, that I, I associate that with you. you. Um, so talk about that, that particular convention, what it does, why it's a really important part of your filmmaking and your inspiration. Well, what I've really been interrogating in my filmmaking these last two films is what are people's emotional experience to the physical action? So if we're thinking about the abduction scene until it's not about the physical abduction. Like that is, but what it is about is what is the emotional experience of Preacher and his family to the abduction? I don't give a damn about JW and Brian. Like I don't care. And even the music, the note, the biggest note I gave to my amazing composer, Abel, um, because the first draft of the music, the score for that scene, it was very, um, it was like thriller-y. And I was like, no, 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 you're scoring to the physical action. Right. We need to score to what Preacher is feeling. We need to have, because that is the ex experience I wanted you all to have. Um, and, and for you to feel that kind of um, complexity of emotions, not just the pain and the sadness, but when we hold on Preacher's face, when he's look like it's act, like, I w that's how I believe that you can really have audiences across identities, across demographics, be able to connect to a scene or connect to a film. And so I, I really, um, I, I started to play with that in Clemency, you know, in those moments that you talked about. Um, at the end of Clemency, there's also, a, there's a scene when Alfrey Woodard, who's playing a warden, watching some, overseeing someone's execution in front of her, instead of looking at the execution, we focus on her face throughout the entire course of the execution, because that's what, that's what matters. That's the human moment. And so um, with M Mamie's testimony, it's not about the lawyer, you know? It's not about cutting to all of these different reactions. Like, it is about Mamie's navigating that moment and the pressure mounting on her and as she, and the tension building inside of her and her emotional experience as she's navigating the interrogation that's what i wanted you all to feel right. you know and so um or even or even you know when at the end of carolyn's damn testimony and, <laughs> you know we <laughs> we we remove focus it's on me it's, it's like oh i was gonna curse sorry curse like a sailor <laughs> It's like, you know, F right. her. It's like, it's, it's, it's about Mamie's emotional experience dismissing her, you know? And, and so I really, I'm, I really honed that um, because I think that's a much more visceral, more, more um, uh, uh, complicated experience. Yeah. It's also more truthful. It's more truthful. You know, because that, that is where the experience yes. lay. Yes. And that's the it, real story. That's the real story. And that's why you're such a great storyteller. Thank you. You know, because telling stories is not about getting the right words. Right. It's about trying to understand the arc and the emotions. Exactly. But you do beautifully. Thank you. Um, I know you have a heart out soon, so we're going to take some questions. Um, my other 25 questions, I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> We later. can talk. We can have yeah, we'll some do. lunch oh, yeah, and dinner. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I look forward to that. It's like, oh, cause now, I, the, the ushers have to, um, I was told that I can't call on people. Um, and so the ushers, oh, um, Oh, where is, where's, 
right here. Okay. Yes. Hey. Hello. Um, this. Hey, thanks. Hi. This is the second time I've seen this movie, and oh, I'm. Thank you. I'm angrier now. Because as people may know, the LAPD killed three people in the first three days of 2023. Mm -hmm. um, I'm furious, so I'm gonna try to be artic articulate and crisp. Um, I have to say, uh, ending, I mean, it was, it's an incredible film artistically, but also politically in forcing you to deal with the universality of the, of the individual deaths, which obviously is what she had to go through, is there's a celebration of her son all the way through, but also you're having to confront the, you know, as, again, as people may know, more uh, black people have been murdered by the police than were lynched in the whole time period that your film is telling the story of. And I have to pose a question from the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, who's brought forward a strategy for an actual revolution in this country. He wrote a piece today, actually, about the history of lynching in this country, and he says, he ends it with the question of how can any decent person not think we need to overthrow this system? And I would like to just put that question on the floor, because I think we have to confront the unreformability of, uh, of the American empire and its refusal, its inability to, to uproot white supremacy. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, where to begin? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think you have a lot of people who would agree with that. The question yeah. is how, how, how to do that. And I, I know you have an answer. I know I know you have an answer because I know we've talked lots of time, Andy. Um, uh, but we'll, we're gonna move on to, to just make sure because we only have like six minutes for anyone else. But that's the question that's on the table. Yeah. Um, and Agreed. the ushers have to take the question. I can't take it even though I could see a lot of hands. Greg? Hello. Question. Hi. Um, my question for you is, what was the intention of uh, and significance of mirrors in the film? And, and what did you want it to, to say about the characters? What was your overall intention, especially for, for Mammy's character? What, what were you thinking when you were making those What uh, do you choices? think I meant by it? You can't do that to me. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think you're, you're definitely thinking about uh, the character's reflection, but also the the country's reflection on on uh, on the problematic history that we have and 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 how we treat black bodies. But I really want to know what you think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I'll say, you know, I I I want I, I'm more interested in people's interpretation. I will say it was very intentional about the use of mirrors, and it was something. It was a motif that my cinematographer and I found while shooting. Um, that we decided to play with and keep in the film. But I think people have had different interpretations of it and I'm more interested in how people receive it than me just telling you. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> there's the mirrors and there's the domestic spaces. Those, those mm -hmm. when you pull out the camera and we see these domestic spaces yes. framed, that's very powerful in terms of what home means. Yes. You know? Yep. So. Thank I, you. Yep. I, I shouldn't. Be, I shouldn't say. I should stop talking. <laughs> um, okay, who's next? I know there's lots of hands, and we got um, we got five minutes. Thank you so much for yeah. this film. Um, I want to know more about you and your mother because mm. we see the relationship with you know Mamie and Emmett, and I I would like to know how your mother mother you and parent you to make you this wonderful screenwriter and filmmaker. Oh, thank you. And um, <laughs> what are the qualities that you would like to share with the audience on how to nurture that for those in the audience that are parents or family members that want to create souls that tell stories like yours? Oh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> you know, so I grew up, I grew up in Alaska. I grew up in a very traditional Nigerian household. Uh, I was raised by two Nigerian immigrants who are African as hell. And what I mean by that is when I told them that I wanted to be a filmmaker, <laughs> it did not go over too well. Um, <laughs> they're like, we did not come to America for this. Uh, you're gonna be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. And if you're not, then you're gonna pay for film school on your own. And so, you know, it took some time for them to come around. 
Uh, but they did come around, and now it's a very different story. They're very supportive and very proud of me. But I will say that one of the greatest qualities my parents passed on to me was this unapologetic, unabashed belief that I can do anything. Even when they, like, I remember when my first feature didn't get into Sundance, I was depressed, I'm moping around in the bed. My father taps me on my shoulder. He's like, get up, don't you know you're a chuku? Um, <laughs> like, no sympathy at all. He's like, get up um, and go make another, like, and so, it, and they, even to this day, it's just like, they're just like, you can do anything you want. And... There's an impossibility, I think, to, to the industry that I'm in, you know. And I was a film professor for ten years, and you know, my students—they all want to, you know, win an Oscar with their first student film, right? And if they don't, then they're they're done. Um, but it's it's hard for me to. It's I have to be honest with them. I'm like most of most people will not be able to make this a financially viable profession, but a few will, you know. And who knows? Um, and so it's hard to have that kind of hope and optimism, but my parents really instilled that in myself and my siblings with anything that we do. And I will say also another thing that they instilled in me is no matter what, you keep your head up and don't ever bow down to anybody. Um, and that was something that I take with me to this day. You know, I'm just like being a person in the world, but especially a black woman in this industry, Massage Noir, this intersection of racism and sexism um, is, I mean, people are more comfortable with me being a mammy, a mule, or their own personal entertainment. And if I refuse that, then I'm an angry black woman. And so to be able to navigate that dynamic with keeping my head up and be willing to walk away if I'm like, I'm not feeling safe, protected, or valued in this situation. I'd rather sleep on my best friend's couch than take your damn money, which I've done before. Um, that comes from my parents. That comes from my parents. Thank you. Well, you you do it. And so you, you get it. Yeah. You get it. And you you do it. You do it well. You're Thank a you. model for all these, especially young people, no matter what their profession, their future is. Yes. You're the model. Well, thank you. You're the GOAT. Thank you so much thank for spending so this time much. with us. Thank you all so much. Much appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please spread the word.